Hey everybody, here's the next video in our series on mediation and moderation. So last week we did simple mediation with covariates, which is model four in SPSS's process. This week we're gonna stick with model four and do simple mediation, but this time with a categorical X variable. And this is an often requested video to really look and understand how categorical variables work in these types of analyses. Next week we'll start moderation. So uh, just a simple model visualization first of how this is going to work. So um, your mediation where X predicts M, which predicts Y, which would be the mediated path versus the direct path of X predicting Y. We can do a categorical X in process. Uh, categorical Y would mean we would need to do log regression and categorical M doesn't run because that would be mixing types of regression. So we're gonna stick with categorical X. And this is multi-categorical, meaning more than um, two categories. If you just have two categories, you can just let it do its thing. If you have more than two categories, this is the steps you'll need to take. So we're actually going to use the same example as the last video, uh, which is the empty cars data set from uh, R. And uh, this time we're going to treat X as a cat multi-categorical variable. So we'll have cylinders. I think it's four, six, and eight. And we won't treat that as a continuous variable. We'll treat it as categories, predicting miles per gallon. And then we'll also say that that's mediated by weight. So a car with more cylinders, it's probably gonna get less miles per gallon, but maybe if it's really light, it'll do better than a heavy car. Right? And we won't do any uh, covariates this time. So let's start with power. Um, I've discussed before that this is kind of a hack at power. It's not, um, you really should like probably simulate this. But if we just wanted to see if we could predict Y at all, which will give you a good feel for how many participants you might need. Let's use G power. It's a free program that's really great. We're going to come over here, go to F tests. And then we're going to pick linear multiple regression, fixed model, R squared deviation from zero. And so this will just tell us if we can predict Y at all. So it doesn't really power the mediation, but it does at least power the regression analysis because something should predict Y and it should predict Y, um, X and M in a, in a similar way. So if we know how much we're gonna think about predicting Y, um, hopefully this will also power the mediation if it's there. So let's say determine, we're gonna pick an R squared here. So last week we did uh, medium, let's go with largest time, so 0.14, calculate and transfer to main, so that's going to transfer it into Cohen's F squared for you. Alpha 0.05, power 0.8, sort of industry standards, make those whatever you would want them to be. And the number predictors. So this is where you have to figure out how that categorical variable works for you. And so what happens when you put in a categorical variable and it gets dummy coded or sometimes called contrast coded is that it will create a set of predictors that um, mimic the entire set of categories. So if you have three categories, it will create you two predictors. Now that seems a little counterintuitive if you've never heard of dummy coding before. I have a separate dummy coding video that you can watch. Um, but what happens is, is it creates you set of pairwise comparisons. So with three categories, it's going to create one versus two, um, one versus three, or you could do one versus two and two versus three, which is kind of a linear pattern. Um, you could do three versus two and three versus one. So it creates you uh, a set of pairwise comparisons and it only creates levels minus one. So if you have three groups, minus one, you'll get two predictors. And that's to keep from creating a singular matrix so the math still runs. And so anytime you have, let's say four categories, you'll get three of these. If you have five, you'll get four, et cetera. Um, and so that's why when you only have two categories, you get one predictor, because it's just one versus two. Um, so what we've got here, and I'm gonna write this kind of down, is figure out X. So we have four, six, and eight as our categories. And if we do the default comparison, what'll happen is we'll have X1, which will be four versus six. And then we'll have X2, this is what it'll look like in the process output, which is four versus eight. That's the normal coding is to take the first group listed as the comparison group. You can change that. You can make it four versus six and then six versus eight. 
Um, but that's, this is the default. And then we'll still have M as our predictor. So we're going to have a total of three, three predictors. Okay. If X were continuous, we'd only have two. And so that's the tricky part for power, is figuring out how many predictors that you'll end up having. So in this case, it's three. Okay, so I'm going to hit Enter. And then what we'll say here is that we need 72 participants. Okay. We only have 32 cars still, so we're still short, um, even with the larger sample size. But uh, we'll continue with the example. It's just had I known this in advance, I should have had more cars in my data set. All right, now we're going to drop right in to doing the analysis and doing the data screening. If you need more information about how this data screening works and why I'm doing the steps I'm doing, there are multiple versions of this in SPSS on the channel that you can watch to get more background on data screening. We're trying to keep these videos a little shorter, so it's just the analysis. So I'm probably over to SPSS. I'm going to try. Where's the data? There's the data. All right, so let's start with um, accurate data. So I could do analyze, descriptives, let's go frequencies today, frequencies or descriptives, about the same. Um, I've already got miles per gallon in here, that's why, so we're going to put in cylinders as our categorical X and weight. I'm going to turn off display frequency tables, turn on mean, let's see here, the min and the max, the standard deviation, should be pretty good. Oh, I do want frequency tables, but only for cylinders, since it's categorical. Okay. If you wanted to, you could also ask for histograms. I don't need them right now. Okay. So the first thing I want to do, I'm going to get rid of these frequency charts for the variables I don't need. Well, I'm going to try. Okay, fine. I'm going to ignore them. <laughs> so we're going to look at the frequency table here. I have no missing data. That's step two, so we're doing pretty good. Um, it did calculate the scores for these, but cylinder we're going to trace categorical, remember. And these look appropriate. So we want to make sure that nothing's out of range in our min and our max, um, and that the means and standard deviations don't appear wild. Okay. Since we have a categorical variable, I'm going to come down here to cylinder. I'm just going to make sure that I have enough in each category. So that one category isn't blank, um, which will cause you some problems with the analyses. So in here is not so great, but I have a at least some people in each category. What we want to do next then, and I'm going to cut and paste these, how they fit into this Word document, which we can find on our GitHub page, which is linked in the YouTube uh, description. So now let's look at, um, we already looked at missing data, we don't have any. Let's look at outliers. So normally we do this three-part outlier series, but one problem with categorical variables is that Mahalanobis will not run with them. And if you want to, you could dump, go ahead and dummy code this variable by hand yourself and then run this analysis we're about to do. But usually if you're using these, these tools, you don't want to do that. Or maybe you aren't comfortable with how to do that. So we're going to not screen the categorical variable because we've already kind of looked at it and we know it's okay. We could split the data by the categorical variable and screen it that way. Um, but in most cases, it's okay as long as you're screening at least the continuous data. Okay. So to do that, we're going to run a regression. So analyze, regress, linear. Okay. We're going to put y and y. So miles per gallon is our dependent variable. And we're going to treat weight here under independence. Now I know cylinder is kind of mildly categorical, continuous, but we're going to pretend like it's totally categorical for this analysis. So I'm not going to screen it because while this will run, um, it would not be the appropriate output. Under statistics, sorry, just kidding. Under uh, saved, sorry, Malinobos, Cooks, and Leverage. Continue. Under plots, Z pred and Y, Z residual and X. Histogram, probability prop, probability plots. <laughs> Continue. Okay. We're going to let this thing run. There it goes. Now we're going to go back to the data. Okay. And it's going to give us all three of our outlier columns. Okay. And so um, we talked about this in the last video, but we're going to kind of create uh, columns that denote whether or not these scores are in or out of range. Okay. So for our Mahalanobis, what we're going to do is the degrees of freedom are the number of variables in the equation. And at the moment, that's just M. Okay. 
So we've kind of left X out temporarily for this purpose. And so now that's just gonna be one. We're gonna look up a cutoff score, um, but I can tell you that, uh, oh, I used to remember it. Uh, it's eight. You would think that this would be the most popular thing on my computer. Here's chi-square table. Uh, if you want to find this table online, just Google chi-square table. It's one of the most popular ones that comes up. So here, oh, no, it's 10. I used to remember these off the top of my head, not anymore. All right, so for one degree of freedom, we want to use P less than 0 0.001 because we want it to be really weird before we uh, take somebody out, and that's 10.83 here. So I'm going to close that. So our cutoff is 10.83. We're gonna go back to SPSS and we're gonna create a bad Mahalanobos column. So I'm gonna do transform, compute, and we're gonna say bad Mahal if you want. This is also how to do this in R. So Mahalanobos here, anybody greater than 10.83 would be considered an outlier, so they would be bad. Back to the data. And so it's going to code that as 0 and 1 for anybody who's an outlier. You can also sort the data. So sort cases here. So that was data sort cases. Um, you can right click on the column. On Max, it doesn't always work. And let's sort descending from Mahalanobis. And it doesn't look like we have any bad outliers. So the highest score is five. So this bad Mahalanobis column is um, totally zero at the moment. Let's do the same thing for cooks and leverage. So when you have to calculate those scores. Okay. So here we've got four divided by N minus K minus one, which is degrees of freedom residual. And so N here is 32 minus K, which is one predictor, um, minus one. So this is gonna be four over 30 which is 0.1333, continue. Let's go ahead and figure out leverage as well. So two times one is two plus two, okay, is four divided by 32 in this instance is 0.125. So we're gonna screen that Cook's column for 0.133. We're gonna screen that leverage, col leverage column for 0.125. If you want to learn more about Cooks and Leverage, the book I'm using is Cohen, Cohen, Aiken, and West. So let's do this twice more. Transform, compute. This time we're going to create bad cook. Oh, lots of jokes here. So Cooks greater than 0.1333. Now let's do transform, compute, undo bad leverage. Leverage greater than 1.125. And I'm hitting the data button here to go back kind of quickly. Now I do see some cooks um, and leverage outliers here. And so if I wanted to look at these a little more, I could um, sort descending. Let's see. Oh, it worked today. It's amazing. It doesn't always work. <laughs> so we've got three cooks outliers. And yeah, so sometimes it does something wonky. And I don't know if it's the user, me, or SPSS. Probably me, right? And so we've got three leverage outliers. Now, one person here who has at least two indicators. But just to make this even clearer, we could do transform, compute. Uh, let's go bad total, sticking with our theme of bad scores. Right. And so we would add all three of these together. Go back to the data here. And I could exclude anyone who has two or more indicators. And this isn't a hard and fast rule. You could exclude anyone with one indicator. So this is something you would need to justify. I take with, stick with two indicators because, especially in a small sample, in one of these could be high leverage or high uh, discrepancy, which is Cook's kind of measures both. Um, but if they mark on at least two of them, that's probably that their scores are kind of far out there. Uh, in this particular data set, we're not going to exclude anybody because we know these cars are real. So if I know the data is real, like it isn't a participant just screwing around, I'll leave them in. 
So it kind of depends on the situation, the type of data I have, that sort of thing. If you wanted to exclude them, you could do data, select cases, and you could say if bad total. So we want to pick the people who are less than two. And then I would hit continue and we'd let the data filter that way. So we could um, exclude them that way without deleting them from our data set. So that later when you, um, when you try to remember what you did, it's all still built in here to the data. Okay, okay right now I'm gonna turn this filter off, but that's how you do it. Well, I'm gonna try. Okay, clear. There we go. <laughs> all right, so from here, now we're ready to do, we're ready to look at all of the charts that we ran. So let's go back to the um, output here. Now, if I had, um, if I had deleted people, I would want to rerun this analysis to get the charts without the outlier. But since I didn't delete anybody, I don't need to rerun that exact regression again. I will run a correlation table though. So, um, well, actually we don't need a correlation table. In this particular instance, we have X and we have M, but X is categorical. So no correlations to run. So let's just look at these charts. So here's normality. Looks pretty good. It's between two and two centered over zero. You know, this is a little low here. So we're missing some data at this end. So maybe a small positive skew, um, but mostly normal. Come down here, look at our PP or QQ plot. Most of the uh, dots are on the line, which is good, which is what we want. And then looking at our standardized residual plot, remember you want the data centered around zero in both directions. And this one's pretty good. Um, however, it is a bit heteroscedastic, meaning that the dots are not evenly spread across the plot. So um, this kind of triangle shape can be a problem here. And that might be because, you know, there's only certain lower limit to some of these variables. Um, but we would say this has some, a little bit of heteroscedasticity. Okay. All right, so all that is data screening. Let's look at how to run the process analysis with categorical variables. So I'm going to analyze regression. We're using version three. And actually uh, had already tried this to make sure it would run. So let's clear that out. So let's put Y into um, miles per gallon into y, because that's our y variable. Okay, there it goes. We're going to put x, our categorical variable, into x here. m, which is weight, as our mediator into m. If you want a covariate, stick them right here in this covariate box. Mediation is model 4. We will now click a multi-categorical. We're going to say that x is multi-categorical. And then this is where you could play around with how you wanted to code those variables. We're going to pick indicator, which will do um, the first group listed as the control group. So one versus two and one versus three. Sequential does one versus two, two versus three. And I forget what the other two do, but you can see them at the top of the output to look at how it works. You'll notice that M is never a categorical variable. So we can't do M as categorical but we can do W and Z. These are going to be for moderation. We want to click options to get, if you want to see the total effects model, so C, path C. Um, you can pick an effect size if you wanted. Leave that one off this time because we don't really use it. And then everything over here, just kind of leave alone. If we wanted to fix for heteroscedasticity, we could pick one of these and I would tell you to look up what these are to figure out which one you think applies to your data. I have no opinions on them. So let's get continue and then okay. All right. So I'm going to double click in here so we can co copy this output into Word and take some notes on it. All right. Like I said, you'll be able to find this document online. Let's scroll up. 
So it doesn't paste perfectly, but it's good enough for our purposes. So here's where the magic happens on the categorical coding system. So what happens is um, it creates these dummy coded variables in the background, and this is how they would look if you actually were to dummy code them by hand. So again, like I said, if you want to learn more about dummy coding, we do have several dummy coding vid videos that explain this procedure. Essentially what this means is that the group with the one will be compared to the group where it's coded as all zeros. So X1 here is gonna be four versus six. And this is just like a pairwise t-test. So the difference, the, the coefficient will be the difference between those two group means on Y. Uh, eight here will be still compared to four. So it's the group with the group with a one is compared to the group with all zeros. Uh, I often, often get students asking me, why can't I just do four as its own category with a one? That creates a singular matrix, meaning that the columns are not unique. Um, so we're doing this as sort of pairwise versus breaking them into completely separate analyses. So we're gonna do four versus six and four versus eight. We could change that to four versus six, six versus eight, and all kinds of craziness. So let's look at the paths here as we go. So I'm mostly just gonna talk about how you report the paths. Um, if you wanted to report F, you could, but generally people focus on the, just the path coefficients themselves. So this first thing we're getting here is X predicting weight. Now if we scroll back up to remember, this is gonna be path A, but there's gonna be two path A's. So essentially what's gonna happen is this model here is gonna have two lines going in to X to Y and two lines going into X to M because there are two pairwise comparisons. So these are considered path A, Z, both of them. So we've got X1, which is four versus six. The B value is here. Right, this first one, which is coefficient, so 0 0.83. Our T value, now our degrees of freedom are the second degrees of freedom here. This lines up a lot better in, in the SPSS output, but it's um, DF2 is this one here. So DF1, DF2, okay, it's 29. And our T value, so this is standard error, here's T, okay, is 2.73. And then our P value is 0 0.01. So I'm writing this in APA style, 1, 1 if I round up. The last two little pieces here are the um, un, upper and lower confidence limit, and we left it at 95. Okay. So what does this predictor mean? So we're predicting M, right? There is a difference in weight between four and six cylinder cars. Okay. Okay. Um, what that means is that uh, this score here isn't the actual difference in the weight for them. Okay, I think weight is coded in tons. Um, but how do I interpret that? Which one is what? So what's happening is the coefficients go from four to six. So it does four minus six. So this is gonna do, um, say that, uh, I think that's the order. We'll check ourselves here in a second. Um, that four cylinder cars are heavier because the coefficient is positive. But this is really hard to think about sometimes. Like I just had to seriously strain my brain um, and it's Friday, so we shouldn't think that hard. Instead, what we should do is just calculate the descriptives by group. Okay. So just to check ourselves. So what we can do is um, this fancy split file. Oops, sorry, I do have to be in the data to do this. So we're gonna do split file. Okay, split file is a temporary piece that doesn't actually split the file. We're just gonna organize output by groups. Um, we're gonna split on cylinders. And then what I can do is do analyze, descriptives. Let's pick descriptives this time. Tell it to give me miles per gallon and weight so we can interpret both of them. I'm gonna just hit okay. okay. And so that's split. The file itself is not split, but the, the output is split. And now I can see the means for each group. Again, I was wrong. So it did six minus four. 
Um, so this is why I always check yourself. So it took the, the score, wait, where's the mean? Yeah, six, so the mean here for weight is 3.12, and the mean for weight for four cylinders is 2.29, so that's where we're getting the difference in, in weights here. All right, oop, that's not what I wanted. I'm gonna go back to Word over here. So it's the difference in weight, and I'm just gonna leave you a little note here. Use split file to look at the means. And then that's what how I'd report. I'd report like there's a difference in weight between the cars, four is this, six is that. Okay. <clears throat> now it's a difference in weight controlling for this other variable. Okay. So now let's think about the other one. So x2, which is going to be four versus eight, the b value is 1.71, t is still 29. And now it's 6.75, P is less than 0 0.001. And now we see a difference in weight for four and eight cars. Okay. And then I could report the means just to make it very clear for users which ones are heavier. And then I use these two numbers here. So those are the A paths. Now we're going to come down here and this is where we're going to get the B path. Not to be confused with coefficient B, but the B path is where we're going to have weight predicting Y, which is MPG. Right, so this is M predicting Y. And so that coefficient is negative 3.20 to one if I round up. Our T value with 28 degrees of freedom. Okay, so I'm still using this here. Equals negative 4.25 and our P value is less than 0.001. Okay, so these two. <clears throat> so what this tells me that is that as the weight goes up, miles per gallon goes down. Which makes sense. Heavier cars take more power to move. Now, pass C prime here, or the direct effect and not the total effect. Okay, or this, yeah, wait, yes, yes, direct effect. <laughs> Had a moment there. Um, and we'll still have two of them. So we'll have x1, which we've already determined is 4 versus 6, right, is negative 4.5. To six. T value is still 28 degrees of freedom is negative 3.07. P equals, if I round up, 0 0.005. So there's a difference in weight or a difference in miles per gallon for four and six cylinder cars. And I could come back to my SPSS output wrong button. I don't remember the output button. Uh, and see here that miles per gallon for four cylinders is 26 and miles per gallon for six cylinders is 19. So that's where the negative score is coming from. It's because it did uh, six minus four. And we'd also do x2 where b equals an even bigger number, 6.07. So about a six Gallon, uh, miles per gallon difference. And we get negative 3.67, P equals 0 0.01. And the interpretation here is that there's a difference in miles per gallon for four and eight cylinder cars. Okay. And we use this number, this number, and then all four of these. Okay, for report reporting purposes. Hit a button. Let's hit this button instead. Okay. Now we could also talk about C. Um, people argue over the utility of C. Do we even really need C to be significant, etc., etc. But I feel like it's 
useful to show you how to get C in case somebody asks you for it. So past C is this is the total effect. So this is the effect um, sort of ignoring that M exists. And we would have to do X1 and X2 again. So we see here every time X is involved, um, we have two of them because it is multi-categorical. So 6.92. So without M, there's a difference in miles per gallon. So here's where I'm getting these numbers from. So here's B. Here's the degrees of freedom. Here's T and P. And so the interpretation here is there's a difference in miles per gallon for four and six. And that is um, gonna be the difference between means because we're not including uh, any other con variables. And then for four and eight, we got negative 11.56, so a big difference. 29 degrees of freedom, it's negative 8.090, and P is less than 0.001. So there's a difference in miles per gallon for six and, oop, no, four and eight. So here and here. Now, what if you wanted the difference between six and eight? You have to recode and run this analysis again. So you would tell it to do the multi-categorical part a different way. Hopefully you'd get the same, you would get the same results, um, but if you wanted that specific comparison, you would have to rerun this analysis. So then none of this tells me if mediation happened. I could think about the Baron and Kenny steps and I could say, well, C is significant. Come back up here, let's look at A. A was significant, one, two. Is B significant? Yes. And the C prime less significant. That's where we run into problems, really, right? Um, well, the, the numbers look smaller, but does that imply that mediation happened? All right, so this would be, in the old style, we'd say this might say partially mediated, because then C went closer to zero, C prime is closer to zero than C, uh, since these are negative. Uh, and, but P is still significant, but we're more moving away from that. And so instead we want to come down here and look at the indirect effects. Okay. So this is the total effect. It's just a repeat of the numbers here. Okay. This here relative direct effects is a repeat of C prime from here. So we have all this already. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Here is the indirect effect. So that's the part we're really interested in. And so uh, the way I've always reported these is I just say indirect equals because there's not really a symbol for them. But remember the indirect is A times B. And so in this case, it's A1 for X1 times B and then A2 for X2 times B. Um, you could report the standard error for this indirect effect. So the indirect effect is about three miles per gallon. And then we can report the 95% confidence interval for that effect, which is negative 4.88 to negative 1.06. And since this doesn't include zero, we would say mediation has occurred for this group comparison. Now, if we wanted to look at the second group, are both group comparisons mediating? Uh, I would say yes. Sorry, this is standard error. Too much of my life type in standard deviation. Eight point five one negative three point oh one. So this is how you'd report this in APA style. My best guess, anyway. And we'd say the same thing since does not include zero would say mediation has occurred for four versus eight. Okay. So here, both sets of categories, category comparisons, mediate the relationship or are mediated. So what's happening is um, the relationship between X and Y, so cylinders and miles per gallon is mediated by weight and that's true for the level, the different categories of X. 
So if it's four versus six, that's mediated. If it's four versus eight, that's mediated. So this gets a little tricky in the interpretation because of that categorical nest. But essentially what you're saying is if I compare four versus six, weight mediates the relationship between cylinders and miles per gallon. If I compare four versus eight, weight still mediates the relationship between uh, cylinders and miles per gallon. So you always have to think about this as a pairwise comparison because X1 is not cylinders altogether. It's four versus six cylinder cars only. So you can kind of think about it as little independent T mediations, right? So four versus six is mediated and four versus eight is mediated. And this happens too, if you like say you have men and women in analysis is gender, you know, predicting something, is it mediated by something else? And so all that together is how you would create um, a mediation model with categorical predictors. If I were to actually draw this model, let me show you my favorite website for drawing these things. If I bring Firefox over here. So what you could do is go to draw.io. Um, because it's hard to draw these in Word sometimes. Then create a new diagram and you don't have to save anywhere and just hit create. But what draw.io does, lets you do is like draw these pretty simple. So we could draw this being X, you hit this button, there's M, hit that button there, there's Y, and you just gotta draw one more line connecting X to Y. And you can play with the shape and the way it looks. You can write numbers on each of these paths. If I can click on the path and just start typing the number, I can add um, my coefficients to the paths. You can start click on a box and just start typing. Oops, that wasn't what that was. It was miles per gallon. So I really love this website because it's a very clean, easy way to make these pictures. But what you could do for this particular analysis is to indicate that there are two categories, just draw yourself some extra lines here to show, you know, this is category one, this is category two. Um, or you could draw two separate triangle diagrams altogether. Um, and so this is how I draw my pictures for what I put into Word to show you guys. I'm just kind of showing you how quick and easy draw.io is. So altogether, that is how we would run the mediation analysis. There's one more last piece and then I'll let you run away. And that's quant psi. So if you want the Sobel test, um, what you could do is go to quant psi. And then there is a place for mediation and moderation. And there's all this stuff here but there's a way to, I found this earlier. Just do it on his website. Okay, fine. What you do is you Google Sobel Quantsai. <laughs> Since I can't find it right away. It would help if you spell Quantsai correctly, but here's the Sobel test. Okay. Scroll, 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 scroll. So what you wanna do is use the T values to me are the easiest um, for each of the paths. So if I wanted the Sobel test, because I have a reviewer that just really loves Sobel, what we could do is find A, so I'm gonna scroll back up for a little bit until I find A. So here's A for the first one, the T value is 2.73. Go back over here. And then find B. Oops, go back to word here. So let me scroll, where was B? B was up one more. No, I'm sorry, B is down here. Here's B. The T value is 4.7 to 4.25. Hit go. And then this could be your test for Sobel. So here's the one I'd recommend, although they talk on this page about the differences between these. Um, so it's 2.25 and the P value is 0 0.02, which we would consider significant at P less than 0.05. And then I could do that whole thing again for the other coefficients. So you'd have two of them. So the other coefficient, the A path is 6.75. And calculate. And then I could get the one for that one. So we could add so bell for both of those. Okay. Great, now you know how to do mediation with 
categorical X predictors in process version three in SPSS.